Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. We'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Hello everyone, welcome. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. Okay, thanks everybody for joining us today at uh, this lunchtime webinar. Um, my name is Tracy Brown. I'm the director of Save the Sound, and um, we're speaking to you from our New York office on the Sound in Mamaroneck, New York. Um, today, our director, our, our, our water quality program manager, Peter Linderoth, is going to be talking about the Unified Water Study which is a really interesting region-wide water quality monitoring program that uh, Save the Sound has been involved in for the past couple of years. Um, so I'm just gonna ask everybody um, as we go during the presentation, please be sure just to use one um, audio uh, access point. If you uh, are using your computer, uh, just use that or your phone, just your phone with your computer muted, especially um, when there's discussion later, otherwise, we get a little feedback loop. Um, while Peter's presenting, please go ahead if you have questions and write them into the chat box. You can open the chat box. Um, if you roll over the top of your screen, you can see view options and open a chat box. Um, our environmental analyst, Elena Colin, is managing that and she uh, will be looking at questions and flagging Peter when things come in so he can respond during the presentation. And then otherwise, if you want to um, wait and uh, do it uh, with your audio on, we'll open up the, all the audio for discussions at the end of the presentation so we can take questions and, and have it back and forth that way. Um, you can also use the chat box if you're having any technical issues. 
um, viewing or hearing the presentation. So with that, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Peter to get us started. Great. Thank you, Tracy. Um, so looking forward to talking about this study today. Um, just quickly mention, I've been on Save the Sounds team for four years now. Uh, time really, really uh, flies. And this study is really at the heart of what I love to do. Um, love being out on the water and understanding Long Island Sound. I grew up in the region and uh, it's just such a such a pleasure to work on this study. I look forward to sharing it with you today. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna dig right in um, and give you a quick overview of what what I'll be talking about. And again, this is a lunch webinar, so please uh, we encourage questions. As Tracy said, either uh, or use the chat, and then Elena will flag me down, and I'll I'll make sure to answer them as we go along. But uh, the discussion overview: one, we're going to talk about the Unified Water Study. Uh, we're going to talk about the development. So the study development, how, uh, how that played out. We're gonna talk about boots on the water. Um, so it's sort of the execution and what's going on with the study now. Um, here's here's a, a set of boots on the water from New England Science and Sailing <laughs> Foundation. One of our, one of the 22 groups actually that are in uh, the Unified Water Study. We're gonna talk about next steps, um, data applications and uh, other, other steps for the study and then love to answer questions and, and just open this up and have some general conversation as well. So it's, it's, it's challenging to talk about the Unified Water Study without um, quickly mentioning the Long Island Sound report card. So I'm going to do that here. Um, this is something that Save the Sound works on. Um, we recently released uh, the, the latest iteration of the Long Island Sound report card, and we looked at 10 years of data, um, Long Island Sound data, and graded those data in a way that um, is very um, kind of just friendly to your general public. Um, people can see it. People understand grades, of course. And uh, one of the fascinating things that happened with this la latest release of the report card is that we were able to show significant overall water quality improvements. Um, what you're looking at on this slide um, is the report card up in the upper left is 2008 grades that were um, calculated for 2008. And the bottom left is 2017. So you can see um, we have a B to A minus, we have a D plus to a B minus. And then of course, we're still working on the Western Narrows. That could be something that we could talk about during the discussion period. Um, but we were able to use statistics and show statistical improvements um, in many areas. So I think I just got muted for a sec there, sorry. Uh, and the, the thing that you'll notice on the Long Island Sound report card too is that it includes open water data, but the bays and harbors here are blue. Um, that was something that we did on, uh, something we thought was a good idea, and it was also advice that we received um, from people when the, uh, some of the early report cards came out. So the bays and harbors aren't included in this report card. And that really segues over to the Unified Water Study, which was developed um, to fill the margins. So a study developed to fill these margins of Long Island Sound and, and produce grades and, and uh, empirical or real water quality data in these bays and harbors. So we're filling those margins. And when we, when we talk about that, there's over 100 bays and harbors in Long Island Sound. Here they are. Um, these light blue colors are bays and harbors. And then sort of the kaleidoscope of colors above them represent their, their um, watersheds, their, their local watersheds. And the UWS is designed to assess the ecological or environmental health of, the, of our Long Island Sound bays and harbors. And um, it, I'm going to get into that in a little bit more detail momentarily. But another part of the study design of the UWS is to make it achievable uh, for community water quality monitoring groups. So um, in the process of designing this study, as you can imagine, um, this was a good year and a half, almost two years in the making, and we brought together a lot of um, different, different stakeholders. Um, so just to start, as we're developing the study, we had agency representation. So we had the EPA, um, Connecticut and New York, New York City. You know, people from management and regulatory positions coming to help us and kind of join the discussions of how the study would be designed. We had community sampling groups, sort of your traditional community sampling groups like Save the Sound and Harbor Watch and Coalition to Save Hempstead Harbor and, and many others all joined us in meetings. And then we had our, our academic uh, representation from um, UConn and Stony Brook and other other universities and the funders were involved as well, too. And it's definitely a collaborative process. We had many webinars um, and, and quite a few in-person meetings. And as you can imagine, when you get all these people together, um, everything under the sun in terms of water quality monitoring came up and we had to, we had to narrow that down, of course, um, collaboratively because 
this, this study isn't just save the sound saying, this is how we should approach monitoring water quality in bays and harbors. It's really um, a collaborative. And it was important to us that all the stakeholders felt um, that they did have their um, opinions listened to. And, and we appreciated all the expertise that came our way as well. And when it when all the dust settled um, and all the all the flip charts and any other tool that you can imagine at a conference or meeting or webinar um, were analyzed and put into kind of one place, um, it was determined that we would need to split this uh, study into two tiers. Um, so tier one parameters, and these are things that groups monitor on the water, are dissolved oxygen, turbidity, chlorophyll A, qualitative macrophytes, that's sort of like a none sum lots assessment, basically of how much seaweed or eelgrass is in a bay or a harbor, and then temperature and salinity. All the groups in the study, um, all the embayments or the bays and harbors in the study receive these tier one parameters. Um, it's sort of baseline for entry. Everyone does it. Um, it's a six month monitoring season from May to October. Um, and then there's sort of like the icing on the water quality monitoring cake, I suppose you could call it. And that's, that's the tier two. And I can talk a little bit more about tier two today, although I'm not gonna dork out too much on the technicalities. Please feel free to hit me up in the chat box and I'll be happy to. But um, the tier two application is a little bit more technical. It involves continuous data logging, specifically for dissolved oxygen, um, quantitative macrophytes, and a host of nutrient sampling that, that is uh, being undertaken as well. And it's the same um, monitoring season from May to October. And what you're looking at here uh, really represents what the UWS is about. We want an apples to apples comparison of all these bays and harbors. Of course, they all have their own fingerprint in a way. So you might be green apples to red apples, but all the groups in the study are collecting data the same way, following the same set of procedures, which allows us to make pretty good comparisons from embayment to embayment. So we can compare Norwalk Harbor to Wickedy Quack Cove or Mattituck Creek to Hempstead Harbor, and these are just, you know, just a few off the top of my head, but the point of the study is to be able to make these comparisons. Um, and there were a lot of groups that were out there collecting data, high quality data, um, but in some cases, many cases, they were following different sets of procedures and, and different sampling seasons, and, and that made it difficult um, to make direct comparisons on environmental health from bay to bay. One of the things we do, and I'm going to dig into the study design a bit, and this is an important part of it. Um, in the study design, data quality is really important to save the sound, people receiving these data, people in the study, of course, too. Um, one of the things that we needed to do to administer and coordinate this study was develop a, a quality assurance project plan. And this is a big, beefy document. Um, and it's really critical, though. Uh, it covers procedures, it covers the labs, it covers all the groups and the stations and, and quality assurance checks that are in place. And this project plan um, includes all the participating groups, but it's administered by Save the Sound. And it's in a, a document that's approved by the, um, the EPA. Um, the Long Island Sound Study a branch of the EPA funds this work. And, and uh, we have some great people over at Region 2 and Region 1 in the EPA that are our quality assurance um, officers and project managers. Um, and it's really it's a pleasure working with them. I don't know how many people say that if there's some experienced water quality monitoring uh, groups out there. Pleasure working on a co-op, I should say, specifically. Um, it's a big beefy document, but they've been great. And uh, this document really holds us all to very high standards in terms of quality data, um, which I'll talk a bit, a bit, bit more about later. But it really just helps um, groups that are receiving these data, like the EPA, Connecticut, and New York, use them. Everything's laid out so they can see exactly how things are collected. And uh, we have a big report at the end of the season where we report on everything that went well, any unexpected events, um, and that is included with all data collected for the season. Let's talk a little bit about the growth of this study. So it's just a basic timeline. Um, 2015, uh, we designed and coordinated the UWS after being selected by the Long Island Sound Funders Collaborative to release the Long Island Sound Report Card. There were discussions already in place um, on having a study for a sound wide study for the bays and harbor in Long Island Sound and it made perfect sense to integrate it in with the report card effort. Um, in 2016, we piloted this study with three very brave groups. Um, we had uh, Save the Sound, Harbor Watch, and um, Coalition to Save Hempstead Harbor. 
I'll mention Cush actually, Clean Up Sound and Harbors piloted some of our non-digital methods as well. And that was just to kind of refine the procedures, um, make sure everything worked. And, and at the end of that season, we did. We went in and looked at the procedures and did refine them a little bit. For 2017, um, that's when the UWS officially launched. That was our first big collective season. And we had 11 monitoring groups in uh, 2017 in 21 Long Island Sound Bays and Harbors. And it's safe to say that we exceeded expectations there. Um, and uh, we're really happy to have done that. I remember Tracy Brown, and I were talking early on, we said, hey, wouldn't it be great if we had six groups or nine groups? But sure enough, opening uh, opening season 2017, we had 11 groups. Um, and, and that's also the season where Save the Sound piloted the tier two uh, application of the UWS that I talked about earlier. Um, we piloted in Mamaroneck Harbor and Little Neck Bay. 2018, we expanded again uh, to 20 monitoring groups and 36 tier one embayments. And in um, 2019, we actually have 22 monitoring groups joining in. So more groups, 36 tier one abatements, but we're also doing um, tier two as part of uh, the annual UWS study now. So it's official. We've officially launched tier two um, and that's that monitoring is currently underway. So here we are. These are all the bays and harbors that are in the sound, um, in the sound, sorry, in the unified water study. And as you can see, we have great representation. Um, lots of bays and harbors. Uh, you probably recognize many of them. I hope, I hope you uh, recreate in one of them. Uh, and as we look here, um, you can see Eastern Connecticut all the way down through Westchester into the Bronx. The Bronx River is uh, joining us this year as is Black Rock Harbor. Um, and then you can look east and we go all the way out to Goldsmiths um, Inlet. Eastern Long Island. Um, we are talking about expanding a bit in the sort of central Connecticut region. So if anyone has some ideas on groups that might want to join there, we'd be happy to, to hear from you. Um, but here we are with all the tier one unified water study embayments. And these yellow circles that just popped up um, are where we're doing the tier two UWS monitoring this season um, with hopes of potentially expanding uh, next year. And here are all the groups. Now, I'm not going to stay here long enough for everyone to read all the groups that are in the study, but you'll get a good snapshot of them. And, and uh, I really do love looking at this table. We initially thought, you know, we probably have a lot of your traditional kind of nonprofit or non government agency monitoring groups, like I had mentioned before, maybe all volunteer, maybe, maybe staffed with some volunteers. But as it, as it all um, turned out, we, we have those groups, of course, but we also have municipal groups uh, like the town of Darien, town of Fairfield, town of Stratford, um, and uh, the Interstate Environmental uh, Commission is also in this study. So it's this has really brought in together quite a few different types of monitoring groups and uh, brought us all to this high quality, um, not to say they weren't before, but brought us all to this high quality project plan um, so we can have these great comparable data. And it's a really wonderful network of groups that's, that's actually um, been beneficial in many ways besides the UWS um, on requests that we receive. But here's our, our table of groups and uh, the embayments that are in the study. All right, so the fun stuff, going to the execution. And here are a few of the groups um, on the water undertaking UWS sampling. One of the things that um, I talk about uh, or Elena and myself or, or any of us talk about first things first with groups is making sure that it's achievable. Um, so groups that are entering the study, um, one of the things that really defines the achievability of this study is that um, our dissolved oxygen has a time criteria in which all the groups need to be out at their stations collecting within three hours of sunrise. And, and no, we're not trying to impede on anyone's beauty rest. Some people handle that better than others. I'm usually out there with a big smile. We have some staff members that, that try to paste on a smile and go through the operations the best they can, but um, it's a lovely time to be out on the sound. And that's not why we set it to three hours within sunrise, of course. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, we do that because in these shallow water systems, <coughs> dissolved oxygen um, has a daily fluctuation. So what we're looking at here is a, a somewhat complex figure, but I'll break it down. Um, on the x-axis, we're looking at dates and times. So you can see this is from late August um, into October. And uh, on the y-axis, we're looking at dissolved oxygen concentration, dissolved oxygen saturation. The important thing to think about there is just dissolved oxygen levels. And as you can see, as you go through this figure, um, 
we get these spikes. Um, it goes, it can go pretty high and then come down. And typically what's happening in these shallow water systems is plants um, are producing oxygen when uh, photosynthesis is in full swing. But then when the sun goes down and nighttime comes, plants actually use up oxygen, they respire. And in some cases where we have bays and harbors that have a lot of nutrients, nitrogen in particular entering them, there's a lot of plant matter. There's a lot of uh, plants floating in the water called phytoplankton. Um, there's also sometimes there's just big mats of seaweed. And what can happen is you can get these really, really dramatic spikes where you get dissolved oxygen concentrations in the middle of the day that are very, very high. The water actually looks like it's bubbling in some cases, the dissolved oxygen is so high. But then at night, typically what happens um, in, in those same, in that 24 hour period is that they flatline and they get to a, a, a level where it's called hypoxic or even anoxic where there's absolutely no oxygen in the water. And that is incredibly detrimental um, to aquatic life in these bays and harbors. Um, and it's something that, um, in some cases, reducing the nutrients entering the system can help stabilize this a little bit. There's going to be natural fluctuations, but when you see these big swings, um, our president, Kurt Johnson, likes to say these bays and harbors are panting. Um, and it's really stressful on the marine life that are within, within them. So we all go out early so we can compare our data. Um, of course, if we were in Mamaroneck Harbor collecting data at 5 in the morning, the director was out there at 1 p.m., um, we might be seeing really low dissolved oxygen concentrations where director shipyards, and I didn't just arbitrarily mention them, they happen to be our Mamaroneck group, uh, might be getting really high DO uh, readings for the same day and we lose all realistic comparability at that point for those data. Another thing we mentioned is the, uh, the schedule. So we say, hey, it's a six month season. You're gonna be out at least twice a month, um, separated by at least 10 days. Um, doing this, um, doing this work. And then we also have a set time where we do the um, seaweed and eelgrass monitoring, which occurs in mid July, July into August. So here's an example of a, a calendar that a UWS group would be following for their monitoring. Station selection was really big um, in, in design and execution of this study. Um, we're looking for representative sampling. And what I mean by that is we want to have a good spread of stations for um, the bays and harbors in the station, regardless of uh, the size, and that we can get the representative conditions. Um, so we don't want to sample right near known pollution sources. That's not bad uh, monitoring protocol. In fact, it's really valuable for certain applications. But for the unified water study, we're looking for representative um, sampling covering six months of time. So um, we, we select the stations with the groups following a procedure in which we lay this kind of honeycomb hexagon grid over their bay or harbor and then develop randomized stations and then get on um, calls with the group, save the sound team, um, including um, our science advisors and select the stations. Um, and at minimum, an, uh, a bay or harbor needs four stations. Um, we tend to max out around 13. Um, but here we're on the right, we're looking at uh, Darien Harbor. It's smaller, it has four stations. On the left is uh, an embayment in Queens that's in the study, Little Neck Bay. Um, and you can see they have more stations, but we'll be able to make comparisons even between these two waterways. And training, we do training. Training is a lot of fun. Um, we actually just wrapped it up a few weeks ago. Uh, it's fun. It brings us all together. Um, we held five trainings in 2019. It also brings these groups together so they can interact with each other. There's a lot of email correspondences and occasional um, calls where we'll have a few groups on, but this is a great way for this network also just to get to know each other. Um, but five trainings were held in 2019. Um, very important, mandatory uh, for all groups, uh, regardless if they're veterans or new. It really ensures that we comply with that project plan I was talking about. And it's, it's also important for good rake toss form. So everyone wants to be a, an aspiring uh, sea lettuce fisher, fishing person like Elena Colon, our environmental analyst here. Um, but these trainings really help everyone stay on point um, with the procedures in place. And I'll also mention that we do field audits. Um, it's not necessarily training, but I did want to include this here. We visit the groups, um, Save the Sound staff will visit the groups and kind of do mock-up um, where they'll go through the procedures, um, not at five in the morning, but they'll go through the procedures and calibrations of instruments and, and rake tosses. And uh, we make sure that everything's in line with the trainings and what the other groups are doing. It's a, it's a really important quality assurance element. Um, we're field audited ourselves too. We have another group that's experienced come and field audit us. So 
it uh, really helps us uh, keep everyone in compliance with our project plan. There's the sea lettuce again. I heard Elena make a little noise next to me when I put this up there. <laughs> All right, and at the trainings, um, we also loan out all the equipment that uh, is necessary for a group to participate in this study. And, and this, is, this is great. This is uh, early on, this was really important because it eased groups entry um, into the study. You know, you can give a group money, you can give them procedures, this and that. But when it really comes down to it, just the procurement of all the different little ins and outs that are necessary for the study take time. Um, and it was decided that we would bring this all into one place where um, Save the Sound is now administering the um, loan program. So all the units and instruments and everything that's needed for the study is loaned out to the groups at the training and they get this hands-on training with the equipment and supplies that they'll be using. Um, it really enhances data comparability because in the off season we do maintenance on all the equipment and supplies to make sure everything's operating properly. Um, it, it lowered the study expenses too, um, in that when you're buying things in bulk, you can, you can have a significant savings. Um, and it does ease the uh, entry process for groups. They don't have to worry about purchasing the equipment and supplies. They just need to get to the trainings and, and follow through with the procedures. Um, and it's really just, it's a helpful component of this study to have the equipment all in one place and loaned out. Um, and on that same note, there's a project laboratory. Um, the first couple of years we had about three labs. Um, this year, 2019, um, we have one laboratory now. It's the Interstate Environmental Commission. They're also a uh, monitoring group in the study, um, but they also take care of our uh, lab work, which is great. And again, it eases group entry. It lowers the study expenses because we're doing so, um, we're sending so many samples over to them for analyses. It strengthens the data comparisons. And for New York, actually, uh, we, we meet with the New York and Connecticut um, water divisions and we, we maintain those lines of communication as the study developed. Um, for New York though, one of the things that was important for New York to use uh, specifically the nutrient data was that we used a um, ELAP certified. It's a, a type of certification that New York laboratories can receive. Um, and New York uh, feels it's very important for them for uses in their management. So we happily just moved things over to Interstate Environmental Commission and now they're our, our uh, sole project laboratory. Then we have data management. Um, when we're talking about all of these data, um, we're talking a lot of data, um, it's important to manage how they come to us and how groups, including us, are entering these data into Excel documents. Otherwise, we'd have 21 probably really well made but different Excel documents that come to us um, at the end of a, of a season. And that would just be incredibly difficult for us to manage and work with. Um, so part of the training and part of the study is that we have a, a uniform data entry template. So groups can enter all the data that's collected in the fields um, off, off data sheets that we actually provide as well um, and enter it into this template. And then at the end of the season, we receive the templates and we receive all the data in a uniform way, which makes uh, consistent and streamlined data retrieval possible. It also makes it possible for us to do things like import all these data into databases. It would, it would take us probably half a year to try to reformat everyone's Excel sheets if we didn't do this um, properly. So um, one of the things that we're looking at here is uh, this is a federally funded uh, monitoring program. So besides the quality assurance project plan, which is necessary for that, it's necessary that these data go into a federal um, data warehouse, uh, namely the WQP, um, formerly known Store It data where, warehouse. And uh, to put all these data in there, if we didn't have this kind of uh, uniform approach, we'd, we'd be in trouble. I think Elena, you agree? Yeah, she's nodding her head. She did the bulk of this work. We'd be, we'd be in serious trouble if we didn't have a, a consistent and streamlined way for re receiving and sharing data. I will mention, um, I, I believe we'll send these um, slides out. Uh, Save the Sounds very open source with all data we collect, be it UWS or bacteria monitoring or, or whatever we're collecting. Um, the Excel spreadsheets of the um, data are available on our web sheet, uh, website. Um, so click this link and you can get to those and, and do your own analyses if you'd like. So next steps, we wanna put all of this together. Um, we wanna support EPA, the EPA nitrogen strategy, which is undergoing um, for nitrogen reductions in bays and harbors and uh, large tributaries and, and some other aspects. So we want these data to support that strategy. Um, like I said, our team has met with uh, 
New York and specifically the, the Department of Environmental Conservation to talk with them about integrating these data into their clean water um, requirements, their Clean Water Act requirements, but also into their Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan, which they're looking forward to doing. These data are really going to help supplement that action plan. Um, and that's looking at um, nitrogen and its uh, impacts on um, bays and harbors in Long Island. And then uh, just recently, Tracy and I were in Hartford uh, meeting with the uh, CT Department of Energy and Environmental Protection team. Um, and we met with them in the past. Again, I mentioned that these are open line of communications that we keep going. Um, but these data are going to be useful for them for their integrated water resource management. Um, IWORM is the acronym on that one, um, but also for their Clean Water Act requirements. So these data are going to have a, a wide range and are having a wide range uh, of applications, which is great. They're going to be providing a roadmap to um, prioritize restoration actions in bays and harbors that may be struggling in terms of environmental health. Um, they will also be packaged into our 2020 report card. We're really looking forward to that release um, where we'll be grading these bays and harbors to help inform the, the uh, largest kind of swath of general public that we can and to engage them in discussions about their local bays and harbors. Um, we also want them to be used in public workshops um, to support local groups and government in taking action. They're very local data. You can look at them in terms of all of Long Island Sound or you can look at them in terms of one embayment or one bay or harbor, excuse me. And, um, we want these data to be useful for those workshops. And we're, of course, going to look to continue and uh, expand the monitoring program as best we can. Um, again, I, I mentioned that uh, including Central Connecticut would be good, and we'll, we'll stay in, in touch with the states and EPA on um, bays and harbors that may be priorities for them and, and try to keep just adding these bays and harbors to the study. Oh, and this is a good, this is sort of a good way to wrap up the uh, discussion. It's what can you do to reduce nitrogen, of course? And here's our, our, our man walking on the water, fertilizing the water directly. And uh, our, our home, things we do at home can certainly impact Long Island Sound. So eliminate, reducing fertilizer use uh, certainly can help, um, or at least being very selective about the fertilizer products that you're using is also really a, a good practice to undertake. Updating and maintaining your septic systems um, or your on-site treatment systems, that's really important. Inspecting and maintaining sewer lines, of course, that's critical. And gosh, I, I guess there could be, you know, 10 to 15, 20, 20 bullet points up here. But some, these are some of the big ones you can do to reduce nitrogen specifically. And uh, that can really have some, um, some uh, beneficial impacts on the bays and harbors in your area. All right, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Um, about 15, 20 minutes. So we have some time uh, to take some questions. I'm gonna look over to Elena. Do we have any questions in the chat box? No, not yet. Um, I'd be happy to maybe just open it up. Um, we can unmute people if anyone has questions. Um, just let us know and we can um, help you unmute if you're having any trouble. Was this data used in the CT Blue Plan? We will be um, providing these data to the um, CT Blue Plan, of course. Um, and uh, Bill Lucy, our Long Island Soundkeeper, has been very involved in the Blue Plan. Um, but the actual release of the data came um, a bit after the uh, a lot of the initial Blue Plan um, things were happening. But we have provided these data um, out, so I'd say they'll be included. And and the CT Blue Plan is sort of a um, uh, Eric is a uh, a process that's not meant to just stop after it's released. So they will be provided to the people that are administering the blue plan and available through that, um, uh, what is it? They wanna have sort of a, a web map where people can go in and really retrieve all sorts of incredible data. Um, and these, these data will be available um, through that web map. Good question. That no, is that it for everyone? So um, this is Tracy again. I'll just thank everybody for joining, and um, you know, keep an eye on our emails. If you're not already on our email list, please sign up, and we do um, issue reports from the field on um, the different monitoring activities, and we will be releasing a report in 2020 that takes the um, data that Peter just presented and puts it into a report card format and will give us that um, comparative look at what we're finding in, in these 36 locations around the sound. 
So, um, so check us out at savethesound.org. Um, and thank you for your time this afternoon. Yeah. And I think I got, I'm sorry to, uh, uh, yeah, it looks like Eric asked something about, was the sound info developed the same way? Uh, maybe if you could clarify a little bit on that one, Eric, I'd be happy to answer it. Ah, I see. Oh, yeah, great question. Um, yeah, and you know, I didn't, I didn't get into that in uh, great detail, but um, so the sampling that occurs, here, I'll just backtrack a little bit. The sampling that fuels, I think this is getting to what you're talking about. The sampling that fuels the Long Island Sound Report Card, or the open sound, um, is provided by Connecticut Deep, uh, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection and the Interstate Environmental Commission. And uh, no, the sampling for the open waters is not conducted the same way as the shallow water systems. And, and that's um, on purpose. Um, it, the, um, in short, the way um, hypoxia works or dissolved, oxia work, or dissolved oxygen um, levels work in the open sound is very different than um, in the shallow water systems, as I was mentioning. So in deep water systems, you can have um, hypoxia start and then sort of um, continue to be monitored and then it sort of rebounds um, and that can ha that usually happens about once it unfortunately happens about once a season and then um, Connecticut deep and these other groups can can see how long it, it uh, persisted but in shallow water systems um, you can have hypoxic anoxic events followed by super saturated events where there's so much oxygen in the water that it's almost too much in a way where it's bubbling off and then and then it plummets again so you, you have these daily um, variations that need to be taken into account. And that's based on the shallow water um, and the way um, there's more seaweed and there's more um, phytoplankton in the system. And it really has a, a different signature um, than the open water. So it, uh, it required a different approach to monitoring. That's a great question. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, with that, uh, as Tracy said, thank everyone for uh, joining. Please check out the website, check out the, those data, and uh, feel free to reach out to any of us on Save the Sound. We'd be more than happy to, uh, to talk about what we're up to. I'll bring up my uh, contact information again for you guys. There it is. All right, thank you. Thanks, Peter.